Turn, please, to Romans 4. Romans 4. We've been on, a, on the subject of faith. Anybody heard about faith? We've been on the subject of faith for some time now. And uh, don't expect that to change anytime soon. And uh, we shifted gears a little bit uh, recently. And now we're talking about what we're calling exceeding, exceedingly growing faith. How our faith grows and develops. In Romans, the fourth chapter, the 19th verse, talking about Abraham, who's called a, a father of faith, and we are called his children by faith in Jesus. Say, Abraham, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he's about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Let's stay, let's go back to that verse. Uh, he was not weak because he considered not the wrong thing. He, he didn't consider. Uh, so much of faith is tied to what we choose to look at, think about, talk about. And since we can choose what we look at, think about, listen to, talk about, then we can choose whether we grow in fear and doubt or whether we grow in faith. It is in our hands. If we're weak in faith, it's because we've continually chosen to look at the wrong things, think about, talk about the wrong things. But that can be fixed. I said that can be fixed. Amen. Now I didn't say it was always easy because when you got glaring issues and problems in your life, they cry and demand for your attention. Amen. Don't they? Yes. But can you turn away yes. from them and focus on something else yes. and talk about something else? And if you do, you'll starve your fears yes. and you will feed your faith <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. And you'll come up to a different place. Amen. And what does that mean? God is able to move in our life according to our faith. And the stronger that becomes, the more he's able to move. I know some people don't like that language. He's able to move. <laughs> people say God is God. He can do anything he wants to, anytime he wants to. That's technically true. But he has ordained that things happen a certain way. And he's not going to violate that. And he has ordained that we receive not according to what he can do, not according to even what is his perfect will, but we receive according to our faith. Many have don't believe that, but it's Bible. It's all over the New Testament. Keep going to verse 20. He staggered not. Everybody say, he considered not. He considered not. And he staggered not. Yes. See, stagger is the word, same word for, as for wavering. How do you keep from wavering? Don't, don't consider the wrong stuff. Quit look, if you're looking at the wrong stuff, talking about the wrong stuff, you're going to waver. Can we control what we look at? Yes. What we listen to? Yes. What we think about? What we talk about, yes. that's good news. I said that's good news because if you will think, talk, uh, you know, focus on the right things, your life's going to change. Amen. Your faith's going to come up. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was what? Strong, Strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. We've seen scriptures that Jesus talked about people that had no faith. We've seen him scriptures where he talked about people that had little faith. But here we see strong in faith, and that's what I'm signing up for. How about you? I, huh? Somebody say, put me down for the strong faith bunch. 
Right? That's the part, that's the group I want to be a part of. Fully persuaded, strong faith, and actually you'll see this phrase in the scriptures, great faith. Great faith, which is what we've been looking at. And we see two specific instances in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus referred to a person's faith as great. It's the centurion and the Syrophoenician woman. He called both of their faiths great. He marveled about it. Now when you got the master marveling about how strong your faith is, is that where you want to be? <laughs> you know, at one point he said when they brought the, uh, the man who had the son who was having the seizures and Jesus sounded exasperated, he said, how long will I put up with you? How long am I going to be with you? You know, how long before you believe he's talking about? No faith, faithless, unbelieving bunch. That's not good impression. He was impressed, but not in a good way. But then in this example, he marveled and turned around and, and told his staff and told everybody with him. He said, I hadn't seen faith like this in the whole country. That's right? Right? Well, that includes them. Is that, that includes his own staff. And, and now think about who it is, a centurion, a soldier, and a Syrophoenician. Neither one of these would you have just selected at who you'd have thought would have had great faith. Hmm? Which, which is insight that you, you find great faith in places many would not expect. And places where you'd think you'd find great faith, you often don't. Places where you think, well, I didn't even know they knew God. <laughs> and not only do they know God, faith that just shows the, most of the church world up. This is revelation that fa great faith is not the result of great knowledge. Is everybody listening? Great faith is not the result of great exercise in religion or so-called piety. Great faith is not the result of these kind of things. Well, how do you get great faith? That's why we're talking about it this morning, right? If it's not just through advanced knowledge, how do you get it? If it's not just through, you know, extreme church attendance and, and prayer, great faith is not the result of, of, great, of extended prayer. Are y'all listening? It's not. A lot of what people call prayer is actually a waste of time. It's, it's worry sessions where you mention God once in a while. <laughs> you need to remember when you, when you begin prayer, you, nothing you're going to tell him is news. <laughs> he already knows. Right? And He's not going to be shocked. And he's not going to have to scramble around. He's not going to go, you need how much? <laughs> By when? <laughs> Michael, Gabriel, how come nobody told me about this? <laughs> what are we going to do? Anybody got an idea? <laughs> now you're thinking about yourself. <laughs> no. He knows the end from the beginning. Yeah, that's right. he, he, he's already made the provision before you knew you had a need. He's not surprised by it. I'm going to say that again real slow. He's already made, provided abundant provision before you found out you had a bill or a need. So it's a good way to start off your prayer. Right? Father, so glad I know you. 
<laughs> because I know that you already know. You already know what the problem is. You already know what the answer is. And even though I don't know it yet, I know you love me and you're going to take care of me and you're going to show me what I need to see and give me what I need to get. But see, that's faith. Now you're talking faith. Faith. Instead of just reacting in shock and fear. Oh, friend, being a real believer, actually living by faith and walking by faith is awesome. It's amazing. Hallelujah. And it opens the door for actual miracles, real miracles in your life. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> uh, go with me, please. Uh, we looked in Matthew, the 15th chapter. Let me see. I'm trying to par this down. If I take this point by point, you, we, you didn't prepare for that kind of time. Uh, <laughs> uh, go to Matthew 8 first. Matthew 8. You know, it pays, and I, I know you do, and I thank you for it. It pays to pray for your ministers because what comes through them affects you. Right? It does. Uh, Matthew 8 in the talking about the, the centurion, we, we saw he had great faith. And uh, we'll, just, we'll just take time and read a little bit of it. This man is a, a centurion, a, a soldier, who is over some 100 soldiers. And he, this is, he got promoted to this rank through uh, accomplishment. And the Roman army was the world power of the time and their military was disciplined and effective beyond any by far that had existed before them. And so you do not advance through the ranks by being sloppy or by not getting the job done. So this is a man who has seen combat He's a man who has uh, lived through combat, and, and, and back then it was eyeball to eyeball, blade to blade. And so he's been bloody, he's been muddy, he, he's been in the, in the ugly parts of it, and he advanced, and now he's over other men. He knows how to give orders, and he knows how to receive orders, and... and uh, he has heard about Jesus, and he's got somebody that helps him that's been, in, that's been sick and been in a bad way. Verse 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came to him the centurion, a centurion beseeching him. Now, they're, they're occupied country. He could have come in demanding, right? He's just a, uh, a carpenter, a carpenter, an itinerant preacher. And this guy's, you know, the Romans are in control. But he's, he came beseeching him. Now, one thing that you'll see that keeps coming up over and over again, great faith is inseparable from great respect. Honor and faith go hand in hand. You cannot separate them. So this begins with him showing someone who in the natural he does not need to kowtow to. When he goes around town with his, and especially if he's moving, you know, on some business for the army with his hundred soldiers, People get out of the way. 
These, these are not just you know, men. They are trained killing machines. They can take you out with a, with a couple of blows. And they have the authority and power to do what they want to in the community. But he comes to Jesus and beseech. We'd say plead. Pleads with him. So there's the right tone. There's the right body language and attitude. He beseeches him. Verse 6 says, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of a palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Oh, I like those words. Do you know Jesus never said, I won't come? Do you know he never said, I won't heal him? You got people that'll tell you sometimes it's not his will. Sometimes he won't come. Sometimes he won't heal. They're misrepresenting God. They're trying to explain why things don't happen. And they're wrong. Hmm? You might as well say, why doesn't everybody get born again? Would you believe if somebody didn't get born again and died lost, would you say, well, then it's not God's will to save everybody? No. Just for whatever reasons, they didn't receive it. Well, the same thing is true about all the blessings of God. You've failed to receive some things. I've failed to receive some things. But it doesn't change the will of God. That's right. Jesus said, don't you like it? I will come. I'll come and heal him. This is not a pastor he's talking to. This is a scarred soldier. And the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. He does not have to humble himself in front of this man from any natural reason. But can you see he's acknowledging something that not everybody saw. God allowed him to see. He probably didn't know Jesus was the Messiah. But he heard about what had been happening with him. And he believes he's a man of God. And he believes that God's using him. And he believes these things can happen. He believes in him. Like we said, you'll find faith in places you didn't expect to. There's folks that have sat in church and heard it for years. And still don't believe it. And you got somebody that's lived a rough life and they hear it one time and go, I believe that. I believe that. And they can get a miracle just like that. It's not great faith. It's not the result of extensive experience with church and religion. I'm going to say that again. Great faith doesn't come by extensive church experience or prolonged prayer. I know we're kicking some sacred cows, but <laughs> let them move. Let them, let them go down. They need to go down. Amen. It's not great faith is not the result of advanced knowledge. You don't believe God with your head, your intellect. For with the heart, man believes, the scripture said. He said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But just give the order. <laughs> give the order. Speak the word only. Oh, somebody say, speak the word only. Now, let's just stop right here. Does he have respect for what Jesus might say? He has respect for him. He has respect for what he can say. He has respect for what he can do. Doesn't he? We know this is an example of great faith. What makes great faith? What constitutes great faith? One thing you will always see. Great respect. Great honor. Honor to honor means to value, to put a great weight 
of worth and value on something. And if you believe something is important and valuable, you treat it differently than you treat something you don't think is important. Which is why he's treating Jesus the way he is. He's not demanding. He's not barking orders. That would show lack of faith. He comes with respect. He comes asking. Hmm? You know, a lot of times you, you need to examine it. Are you asking or are you telling? Right? Because if you're telling and your attitude's wrong, it shows your faith is lacking or not even there. We live in a crude, rebellious, defiant, disrespectful world. And many have grown up not being taught honor and respect like they should. Their parents weren't taught it. Their parents before them weren't taught it. Some things have been lost. But we don't have to be conformed to the world. One thing that I'm excited about our children they're getting some things about the honor of God. Hmm? Oh, that ought to make you shout. They're, they're getting some things about the honor of God, and it's, it's, it's changing their lives. It's possible for an entire, this entire next generation to be changed. The Lord tarries is coming. It starts with us. We don't just need to talk about it. We need to demonstrate it. Amen. Somebody say demonstrate it. We need to demonstrate honor and respect. It's not about making a big deal out of people. You treat people uh, differently because you honor him. If he called them, you respect that. If he uses them, you respect that. You're not making a big deal out of the flesh. You're making a big deal out of the one that called and anointed and used. So he says, you, you don't need to come. But if you just give the command, if you just speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. That's what got Jesus. That, can you see this? That's what got him. He's been, he's been wrestling against unbelief. He's been preaching everywhere. And, and his, even his own staff has heard the most amazing faith messages you've ever heard for month after month. And then, then you know, they still come up and go, we didn't take enough bread. <laughs> and they've seen multiplication of the loaves and fishes multiple times. And the faith just is not there. It's not there. And here he is traveling from one place to another. And here comes this rough guy, this soldier, this centurion. And the respect is just right up here. The honor is just right here. And the faith. You don't need to come to my house. No, sir. No, sir. I'm, you know, look at me. I'm not a preacher. He doesn't see himself as a spiritual guy. And yet he is. And yet he is. He said, if you would please, sir, give the command. <laughs> and my servant shall. That's what got Jesus. If you'll give the command. Now, we, we need to back up. This is not a fairy tale. What was wrong with his servant? What, what did it say was wrong with him? Grievously vexed. Is that right? Grievously vexed. My servant is laying at home. That meant palsy is paralysis. Grievously tormented. And he's in a lot of pain. Can God heal paralysis? Yes. <laughs> Keep going, verse 7. He said, I'll come and heal him, verse 8. Speak the word only, verse 9. Just give the command, please, sir. He besought him, pled with him. And my servant shall be healed because... 
I understand orders. I am, I have people who have rank above me. I'm under their authority. And then I got soldiers, obviously we know he's got at least a hundred, under him. And I say to this man, go. And in the Roman army, you did not say, do I have to? <laughs> you know, I just don't feel like it. Uh, uh-uh. you, you, by, by the time he says, go, and you, you, you get yes, sir, out of your mouth, he needs to see some dust. He needs to see some dust coming off of your heels. Go. And what happens? He goes. I tell another one, come. What happens then? He comes. I tell my servant. So, now, oh, thank you, Lord. Here is why he can believe for his servant like he can. His servant is submitted to him. Can you see this? We live in a society that despises submission. Despises it. You mention the word. <laughs> you may lose half your crowd. It's, treated, it's, it's, it's seen as a archaic. We got delivered from that. <laughs> submission? I don't submit to anybody. Yeah, that includes God. Submission to God is shown, demonstrated in submission to men. Folks don't like that either. But one of the reasons why people are not able to help others with their faith is because the submission and respect is not there. But he knows he can use his faith, whether he understands it or not, I'm sure he didn't. He's a soldier. He's not a theologian. But he just knows he can. Why? Because when he tells his servant to do something, he does it. So he's not going to argue him and tell him he can't believe for his healing. I tell my servant, do this. What happens? He does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. The master marveled. It'd be like us saying, you know, wow. And he said to them that followed, verily, we'd probably say, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you, I haven't found so great faith, not in Israel. <laughs> now, that probably didn't make everybody happy because they also despised the Romans. They were occupied by them. No doubt there were a lot of atrocities that had been committed by, by him. And here's a guy who's a priest with extensive higher education in the law. Are you going to tell him that a Roman soldier has got way more faith than he's ever demonstrated? <laughs> Jesus marveled. He said, I have not found faith so great. No, not in Israel. Verse 12, verse 11. I say to you, many will come from the east and west, will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The children of the kingdom will be cast out, out of darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just because your parents were Christians doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you've been to a church bunch. Doesn't mean you love God and respect God. It's not the same. And what he's saying is what we've been talking about. There will be people who you would have thought would have been in for sure, and they're not. Never were born again. And there are other people you'd think, no, I, you know, how in the world would they even know how to believe God? And they're going to demonstrate some of the greatest faith you've ever seen. Verse 13. Jesus said to the centurion, oh, this is what he wanted to hear. What's he want to hear? Give the order. Please, sir, give the order. Give the order. Jesus said, go your way. What do you think happened with that centurion? Man, he braced. He came to attention. Go your way. And as you have believed, 
So be it done to you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, you don't need to come to the house. I don't need to hear a big prayer. I don't need to see anything. You don't need to touch him. Would you just give the order? And he did. How, how many think what happened? Now, now what, what did the centurion say? When I tell my, one soldier, uh, go, what happens? He, when I say come, what happens? So when Jesus said, go your way, what do you think happened? <laughs> As he was hollering, thank you, sir, you can see dust coming. Is that right? He, he's gone. He's out. And what happened? Come on, what happened? And the servant was healed in the self-same hour of what? Paralysis and pain and incurable stuff. And within the hour, his servant is up saying, you want something to eat? <laughs> Let me polish your breastplate for you. Is that right? Does your sword need sharpening? Yes, sir. <laughs> the best use of a healing is service to God. The Lord strengthens you and heals you. Don't waste it doing nothing. Get up and start helping somebody do something for God. Is that right? That's the best use of your healing. Oh, hallelujah. Are you okay, friends? Yes. Go with me back to Romans. We were over there during offering time. No, I'm, I'm moving too fast again. Say, so Lord, help him <laughs> not to move too fast. Uh, are you still in Matthew? Notice this again, and then I want us to put up another verse on the on the monitor the, the screen. Matthew 8, 13, Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so be it done unto you. As you have believed. Why? We said you can't separate honor from faith. First Samuel 2 is where these words that are up over the uh, stage area here come from. First Samuel 2, 30 the Lord said, them that honor me, I will honor. I want you to hear the similarity in this. As you have believed, so be it done to you. Could you say it like this? You've honored me. I'm honoring you. How? As you've believed, if honor is inseparable from belief and faith, then you could say it, as you've honored me. Did he honor him? He did. And did the Lord honor him by, by giving the command? Yes. The two are inseparable. Now go with me to Mark 6, and you'll see such a perfect example of this, and then I think we'll make our way to Romans. Mark 6 and verse 1, I am so thankful for this revelation. I've seen pieces of this throughout the years, but I see it clearer today than I've ever seen it before. Thanks be unto God. It also answers questions why faith is weak. It's because disrespect is so prevalent, including church. Folks just, in so many cases, don't know how to act. I was at a place a while back, and uh, the pastor and I were walking around the church. He was showing me some of the new stuff that they had, and, and uh, I was, uh, the Spirit of God was giving me some things for him, and we were talking about it. And some people came up, and they interrupted us rudely and callously, and he didn't say anything. I didn't say anything because it's not my church, it's not my church. Not my place. This has been a couple of years ago. And, uh, and then I noticed we never got back to what the Lord was saying about that. And, and it left me. And he never brought it up. This is not okay. People will stop important things 
because their child interrupted them for nothing? Did you hear me? When it would be a perfect example to teach the little one. No, not now, baby. We're doing this. This is important. And then adults have never been taught things. Now, you, you don't go around on walking around on eggshells. You don't, you don't go around afraid you're going to say and do the wrong thing. You just want to, uh, to be aware that if something important, something of God is going on, you don't interrupt that. You don't interfere with that. Right? right? You wait till it's done. You, you support it. You help it. You don't hinder it. Come on, are y'all with me? Would you like to learn more about this? Yes. Just lift your hand right now and say, Father God, Father God forgive, me forgive me for being calloused, for being calloused or, disrespectful or disrespectful of you, you your things, things, your people. Your people. Teach, me Teach me what's important to you, important where, to you. I where I should show respect, how I should show respect. Should show respect. Enlighten me. Help me in Jesus' name, I ask it. Glory to God. That's good. He's going to answer that prayer. He's already begun. Amen. But just pay attention if something's going on and he checks you, he tugs on you, then just stop. Quit talking. Look, listen. Pay attention. See what's going on. And uh, I've, I've noticed this. I've been traveling. Phyllis and I have been traveling now over 30 years all over the country, other countries. We've been in all kinds of churches, different denominations. And it just, it's consistent. Every place you go, everything you do, the more they respect God and the things of God, the more he gives you. The stronger the anointing, the more revelation, the less they respect him. And the thing is, you'll see some good people with good works that just are sadly lacking in respect for God. They don't, they don't see it. They don't realize it because they just hadn't been around it enough. Weren't, didn't learn it at home. Their parents didn't know it. But uh, you, you'll see, I, you know, I, I can tell. You can sense it because it's tied in with faith. People that respect, for one thing, they're not trying to tell you all about their self nonstop. <laughs> it's not just I, 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 I did this, I did that, I think this, I feel this, I like this, I, 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 I don't like this, I, I, I. That's not being respectful. But people that really do respect the things of God, by the time, I mean, you're not around them any length of time, God will start giving you things. Start giving you things. I'm talking about as a minister. You see this right here with Jesus himself. Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus went out from there. He came to his own country. This is his hometown, where he grew up, his home area, county, whatever you'd call it. And his disciples are there with him. They follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. He's been in this synagogue many, many, many times. He's, his neighbors go here. His kinfolks go here. His family's here. This is where he grew up. And he, he, he's teaching in there. And many hearing him were astonished. And this is not in a good way. And they're saying, where did this guy get these things? What is this? This is disrespect. And, and what wisdom is this that's given to him? Such mighty works wrought by his hands. Because he's taught, we know that he would use the passage out of Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord's on me, because he's anointed me. And they had heard things that had happened in other places. And he gets there and talks to them the same thing that he did in the other towns. And they're going, who does he think he is? This is blatant dishonor. And it's so common that nowadays people wouldn't even think much about hearing that. Boy, he really thinks he's something, don't he? Is it that he thinks he's so much or that you don't think it's enough? 
that your respect is so low or none, not even there. They said, isn't this the carpenter? This is Mary's boy. I mean, my cousin works with his brother James down at the factory. <laughs> and Josie's and, and, and Judah and Simon. I mean, he fixed a, you know, a plow stock for me last month. And his sisters are here. My sisters and cousins go shopping with them and, and, and washing. And, and they were what? Offended at him. At what? He's, he's saying he's too big. He's thinking he's something. He forgot where he came from. We know him. He grew up right over there. Somebody say disrespect. 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 Now look at the rest of it. Jesus said a prophet's not without honor. What's the problem here? Lack of honor. But in his own country, among his own kin, in his own house, he had he, his own brothers and sisters are probably there. His cousin, John tells you his own brothers and sisters didn't believe in him back then. So what are they thinking then? They're thinking, <laughs> Bubba <laughs> has got him an entourage and has gone to his head. <laughs> he thinks he's some big deal now. <laughs> he is a big deal. Amen. And it's not that he's thinking he's too much. It's you're not thinking he's enough. Amen. And what happened? What happened? He could there. That means couldn't. He couldn't do mighty works there. Jesus couldn't do mighty works there. Most theologians don't even accept this verse. It upends their theology. They go, oh, they try to do something with it. He couldn't. Except laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Why? There must have been a few there that had some respect. Right? I don't know if they made him around the corner when he left and said, Lord, I'm so sorry the way they talked to you. <laughs> but if you could just touch me right now. <laughs> huh? And a few of them got healed. Oh, somebody say glory to God for the truth of his word. Verse, he could there do no mighty work save he laid his hand on a few sick folk and he healed them. And he did what? Marveled. Now see, we see him marveling about the centurion's great faith. Mm -hmm. But just as radical in the other direction, he's marveling at them. At what? Their unbelief, which is inseparable from their disrespect. Oh, can you see it? Can you see it? You show me unbelief, I'll show you lack of respect. They are inseparable. Marvel because of their unbelief. How do you fix this? How do you fix this? This unbelief, this dishonor, this disrespect. He went round about the villages teaching. What do you do? Get the word. Get the word out. Some will listen. Some will receive it. Some will repent for their hard hearts and their rebellious, disrespectful attitudes. Keep, keep telling it. Keep talking. And our father in the faith, Brother Kenneth Hagin, told us this numerous times. Sometimes people would get upset at him. Not, not sometimes, a lot of times. And, I mean, we were one of the first crusades he took us with him on over in the Northwest. When we got to church that night, I was so thrilled. Phyllis and I were so thrilled to be in the car with him going to the meeting. <laughs> Which comes back to what? Respect. I know... Uh, Sometimes a person asked me one time, said, how'd you, how'd you believe to be a rhema teacher? I didn't. I didn't. How'd you believe to wind up overseeing healing school? And I didn't. You know how it started? I was there for three months. First three months I was there. Nobody knew me. We we're little country folks from nowhere. Nobody knew. And uh, they announced they're going to build and open 
a prayer and healing center. And, and Brother Hagin was going to teach and train folks to minister to the sick. Divine healing technicians, he called them. <laughs> I heard that. I thought, oh, would that be something else? I esteemed it. Didn't realize what I was doing at the time. I was just, oh. And I looked around behind me. I thought, man, would it be amazing? to be a part of that. And I looked around, there was like 500 people behind me, and I thought, <laughs> I'm sure they all feel the same way, and who am I? Less than a year later, I was one of two that was selected to start it. How'd that happen? Decades later, the Lord corrected me. He said, when you looked around and said, I'm sure everybody feels this way, he said, you were wrong. Everybody didn't feel that way. They didn't feel the same way. Them that honor me, I will honor. I will honor. If you value it, if you treasure it, if you'll use it to the best of your ability, God will give it to you. And if you do good with that and you keep on honoring and respecting it, he'll give you more. That's right. And he'll give you more. You get to the place where you despise it and don't respect it anymore, you're going to lose it. You'll lose what you have. That includes each other. We need to appreciate each other and value each other and respect. The Bible said esteem each other better than yourselves. Didn't it say that? You need to ooh and ah over them. Right? And don't get mad if they don't ooh and ah over you. That ain't, that ain't your job. That's not your job. <laughs> what happened? Well, that, uh, not long after, well, I guess a few years after that, Brother Hagin took us on some crusades with him. Let me have a part. Let me speak in them. And this is one of the very first ones. Phyllis and I were in the car. Boy, I, I was grinning like the cat that got the canary. I thought, look at here. Look at here. We are, because you, you could feel the presence of God. Man, you could just sense the anointing. The, 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 the facility was packed. Man, the, 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 the God was there. And we get to the outside of the place, and there's these yahoos walking around with signs. <laughs> Talking bad about Brother Hagin. You know, ugly stuff. And they had not a clue. Some of the signs, I thought, where in the world did you get that? He's never said anything like that. But that's how the enemy works. Disrespect. What's the enemy trying to do? He's trying to get people to disrespect the ministry, the anointing, the word. If, you, if he can get them to do that, he can take away the power. He can... If Jesus couldn't do mighty works there, then you're not going to either. We've had some folks that gotten irritated at us at times about how we do things at the church. They say, well, you should. Why, why doesn't just anything go? It's not a matter of, of being rigid. It's a matter of showing respect. That's right. And it's not just showing respect for people or flesh. It's showing respect for him. We, we don't want any, we've had people all the time try to get us to rent our facilities out to them, to do events, to do this and that. This is a holy place. It's his place. He gave it to us, right? When that's not supposed to have a bunch of ungodly stuff happening around here. Is that right? We tell people, don't try to solicit business on the grounds. Are y'all with me? Yes. Don't try to do business deals on the grounds. This is a holy place. If you need to talk about that, go somewhere else. Yes. Amen. Are y'all with me? Yes. We say zero strife around here. Yes. No, I don't care who's right, who's wrong. No strife. Zero. Why? God's good to us. He's given us a church. Churches. And partners. He's given us facilities and abilities. We should take care of it. 
We should treat it a certain way. Is that right? We should treat each other a certain way, and it's all part of honoring him. And what did he say? The more you honor me, the more I'm going to honor you. Go with me in closing, I think, to Romans 10. I sure hope you can come back because we didn't get to half of what I had in mind. But I believe we got to the, the part we should have today. Thanks be to God. The centurion, Jesus, marveled at his great faith. What did we see? Great respect and honor. We see him marveling in his own, own hometown at their unbelief. What was connected to that? Sarcasm. Watch out for sarcasm. It's disrespectful. Well, I guess they think they're all that. You should not talk like that. You're a believer. You should not talk like that. Y'all with me? You either, if you can't show respect, just change the channel. Right? Don't talk about it. Don't, don't focus on that. And especially when it comes to the things of God, have to understand, you can be cutting up and acting silly or whatever, but when the holy things of God come up, we need to see a change in you. Amen. Right? You need, you need to show some, I'm not talking about fear, I'm just talking about respect. Amen. Treat it like it's important, because it is. Yes. Treat it like it's life changing, because it is. Like it's precious. Because it is. And in so doing, you'll be exhibiting the same kind of great faith that caused Jesus to marvel. In Romans 10, we, we read the first part of this. Romans 10, 15, let's look at it again. How shall they preach except they be sent? You, you'd have never given an offering unless you valued something. And the reason you can part with money is because you value that more than you do the money. Is that right? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, bring glad tidings of good things. Does that sound like respect? You're saying, that's some beautiful feet that brought you to preach that good word to me. Right? If somebody is getting upset because they think the preacher's shoes are too nice, <laughs> what is that? We, uh, now don't misunderstand me. Preachers can be crooks, just like any other profession. Lie and steal. Ain't nothing right about that. There's nothing okay about it. But uh, I know one of the first houses Phyllis and I got. Uh, there in Tulsa, we'd been believing for 15 years for a house. We went from a crummy little apartment in a bad part of town to a better apartment and in a, on the third floor that you had to walk down to the basement to do your laundry and, and towed everything up three flights of stairs. And, and then we got, we believed God to get into what most people would call an average apartment. But to us, it was a big step up. And then finally, we got a rent house. Had our own washer and dryer. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> and a garage, a garage. And our own washroom. Oh, praise the Lord. And then we were able to get a, a pretty good little house of our own. And for then for 10 years after that, we're believing for a certain kind of house, a vision house. Nice house. And 10 years had gone by. We had sown seed. We're believing and expecting. And the Lord helped us to get it. It was, it was miraculous. It was on an acre a half and a half of land in a very nice part of town. It covered, you know how a cul-de-sac will kind of make a curve. It curved around that whole side of the, it had a tennis court. It had a great giant pool. It had a seven-car garage, marble floors. I mean, this place is okay. And we didn't even know it was for sale. We drove by it and had a witness we should look at it. 
No sign or anything. Come to find out, it was in foreclosure. And the Lord dealt with us while we're out on the meeting, make them an offer of this. It was a crazy low offer. They came back within 10,000 of this crazy low offer, and God through a number of other things, one of the other, we needed money, we, we, we weren't able to just pay for it and get it at that point, but to get in it, we were sitting in the parking lot, you remember that, I know you do, and somebody called us, uh, was it the same day we're going to the bank? Same day we're supposed to go to the bank. We didn't have the money. Somebody called us in the parking lot. We were thanking God for cell phones that day. <laughs> and uh, this is back decades ago. And they said, uh, the Lord dealt with us to send you X amount of money. It was, it was our offering from that meeting. Oh, it was our offering. That's right. Excuse me. It was our offering from that meeting. And it was way more. It was a Wednesday night offering. And it was, you talk about a Wednesday night offering, man. It was, and it was more than enough to put us in that house. So we got in there. Now we were traveling so much back then that uh, somebody came and saw, saw visit the house two years after we moved in and they said, did y'all just move in? Because the pictures weren't on the wall, boxes were still unpacked. Because we'd only been there a few days and then, man, we're gone again. We're, we're on the road. But uh, I went to get my hair cut not long after we got that house and the lady that was cutting my hair, she said, you know, Brother Keith, somebody came out here today and just made me mad. I said, what? She said, they talked about you and your house. And said, they drove by your house and said, it just made them sick. Made them sick. What in the world did you need a house? Now, of course, they don't know that we probably paid less for that than they paid for their house that was a third the size. They don't know that and they don't care. If you don't even try to find out, it means you don't care. You just want to be mad. But I, I tried to calm her down. I say, oh, you know, just don't pay any attention to it. But what struck me about it, what's the thing? They are saying that's too good for those preachers, aren't they? That's too good for them. Now, now what is honor? It's value. So what they're saying is that that house and stuff is way more valuable than us. And of course, if you lied and stole and got the house that way, that's dishonorable. That's being a crook, right? But if you got it the right way, if the Lord added it to you, He's honoring you. And then if somebody's going to despise what God did, you're despising God who honored it. The Bible said we're to count those that labor in the Word and doctrine worthy of double honor. Double honor. That's not just so that the preachers can live good. If there's double honor, oh, I don't know if you got this today or not. There's double faith. Oh, there's double faith. That's going to affect the revelation that flows. That's going to affect the healings that happen. It's going to affect the provision. Everything. It's not about making a big deal out of people. It's certainly not about playing big shot. I, I know, you know, y'all know me a little bit, but you're looking at a fella that cares the least in the world about playing big shot of most anybody you've seen. I just despise it. I don't care about people seeing and knowing me. I'm so why are you all over the TV and everything? To get the word out. To get the word out. To get the word out. I tell you, I'd rather than... I'd rather do this than eat when I'm hungry. See somebody get an answer. Amen. See somebody get set free from some confusion and ignorance and darkness. See somebody find out their sins are all washed away. <laughs> See somebody find out they're healed now. Oh, Amen. glory. Now that I care about. Amen. That I care about. Amen. And I'm convinced you can't spend too much money on that. Amen. Can you? You can't spend too much. On doing the work of God and doing it at the highest level and doing it right. Amen. So some people think completely wrong about these things like people in Jesus' hometown. And God, the Lord, is unable, can't do mighty works in their midst because of it. People that should know better. People that grew up around it. And you got some rough, scarred guy. 
You got the Syrophoenician woman. Oh, dear me. They were known for their carnality and ungodliness. Show up and just believe God and blow everybody out of the water. Why? Show respect. Finish reading this with me, please. Verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? We Phyllis and I saw the same thing when we were uh, first married and we got our first tapes on uh, faith and redemption and prosperity. We got so excited. We shared them with our friends and most of them were unimpressed. We were just ecstatic. And I remember I, I, I shared with some, some, some free pulling and I saw them the next day. I said, well, what about it? They said, oh, I hadn't listened to it. I said, man, listen to that. That's going to change your life. So I'm a week later. Did you listen? i part of it. I don't go for all that, they said. And, you know, 20 years later, our lives are totally changed. We were at a different place we ever imagined we'd be. 20 years later, they were right where they were. It's not because we're so amazing. It's because by the grace of God, we chose to respect it instead of despise it. We kept feeding on it instead of going, I ain't got time for all that. Who has believed our report? Somebody say, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. <laughs> so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What I want you to see is he's talking about Respect. He's talking about the feet of them that bring the gospel. And notice the rest of it. Verse 18. I say then, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth. Their words unto the ends of the world. Has this word not been available to other people? It is available. It's all around. Verse 19. I say, did not Israel know? Moses said, I'll provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, by a foolish nation. I'll anger you. But Isaiah is very bold. And he says, I was found of them that sought me not. He's talking about us. I was made manifest to them that asked not after me. He's talking about us. But to Israel, he says, all day long I stretched forth my hands unto what? A disobedient and a gainsaying is back talking. Back talking people. What's this got to do with faith? Verse 17, he told you how faith comes. It's in the middle of talking about respect and honoring the feet that brought the messenger or the people who just kept on being disobedient and back talking. You cannot separate great faith from great honor. You prayed the prayer a few minutes ago. Branson prayed the prayer. Everybody online prayed the prayer. I believe something tremendous is already working inside of us. I believe we're going to recognize things we haven't recognized before. We're going to see disrespect. Now, now, let me caution you. You're going to see it. You're going to notice it more than you have. It's not your job to correct everybody. It's your job to fix yourself. Hmm? Don't, don't go around correcting everybody about it. You correct you. Everybody hold your finger out like this. All right, now turn it around. <laughs> this, this is what we're going to do. I'm serious. Don't you go out of here and abuse this holy word and start trying to straighten everybody around. Uh, you know, you'll just cause problems. No, right here. If you see something that you, ha you haven't been doing but they're doing, you just need to make a note. I'm not going to do that. By the grace of God, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk that way. Take it for yourself. Yes. Be the student. Yes. Be the disciple. Yes. The learner. Stand on your feet if you would.